I think maybe the over-the-top dislike some fans exhibited towards Dark Souls 2 caused the developers to walk back on ideas that were genuinely better. Okay, I, 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 I could spend a good deal of this video defending Dark Souls 2. In fact, I'm going to compile a video looking at the central complaints about it. Um, and why all of them are wrong and lies from criminals, and I'm gonna put that up in a separate video a bit later on. Uh, when that comes up, I'll put the link here. So, okay, cool. Uh, back to Bloodborne. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to part two of my measured response to H-Bomber Guy on his video, In Defense of Dark Souls 2. We've covered the healing portion of Harris's video extensively, so let's move on to the second section, Enemy Design. Harris opens with a common criticism from many that there are too many people in armor populating the fights in Dark Souls 2. He explains that people don't just have an issue with it aesthetically, but it is a mechanical issue too. Another way of saying it is you learn one kind of fight and you have subsequently learned them all. He then moves on to say that Dark Souls 1 has a selection of more varying enemies, such as Seath the Scaleless, Nito the Gaping Dragon. This in contrast to Dark Souls 2 that he admits has many humanoid enemies to fight. There are quite a lot of humanoid opponents who fight with swords in what amounts to a duel. But here's the thing, I'm gonna make a different argument here. I'm not gonna argue that the bosses are all sufficiently different, which in my opinion they are, or that there are plenty of different kinds of boss fight breaking up the monotony, which there is, but instead I'm going to play the wild card and be the needless contrarian that people say I am. I'm gonna argue in favor of dudes in armor. So first he admits the criticism that there are many dudes in armor, and that's fine, but I personally would still be asking the people with that criticism, what is the deeper problem with that, in specificity? Is it that it's boring? I mean, we won't know for sure, because Harris is once again not giving a quote or probing the person, he's just uh, working with one statement. Regardless, he then says that the boss's being sufficiently different is present in Dark Souls 2, to which I am happy to agree with, since I don't know what sufficiently would be. And he says that there are plenty of different kinds of boss fights breaking up the monotony while citing the Demon of Song and Duke's Dear Freya. This to me is also fine, I would rather criticize the quality of the boss battles instead of whether they were different enough. The Bed of Chaos was a hell of a lot different to the other bosses in Dark Souls 1, but it was easily the worst, so I need something more thorough than what is being said to chew on. Also, as to the needless contrarian criticism, I feel it only applies to his channel sometimes, as that is a criticism many have labelled me in the past also. But this video would be a classic example of needlessly contradicting the general consensus in the face of damning evidence to simply defend that which you love. It has been proven with life gems, let's see how it fares with other sections. He says he's going to argue in favor of dudes in armor. I don't know what that means, but let's find out. I think the best kinds of fight in games are against enemies on roughly equal footing with the player. All games, not just Souls games. There's something viscerally satisfying about facing off with someone making use of the same skill set as you. So he begins his statement with, I think. That's something we can all appreciate going in, that this is just his perspective. Enemies that are on roughly equal footing with the player. I find it really strange that your identifier for the best boss fights being good is whether they're on similar footing to you as opposed to them being simply well made. Let me clarify. Look at this.
Now, none of those things are on equal footing. The whole point of the game is that you find absolutely ridiculous ways to bring these creatures down against their judgement of the situation. The scale and spectacle and overcoming of something that has far more power than yourself is satisfying. Now look at this. If you're playing carefully, then none of these aliens really have the ability to knock you out before you can knock them out in this campaign. However, their ability to heal, to move across walls and stay hidden while stealthily appearing behind you and to approach you in numbers gives them an edge. Just because your opponent has a dissimilar set of abilities, giving them benefits you cannot have and drawbacks that you also don't have, doesn't really mean that they aren't as engaging. The real result here is that fights need to be well designed, rewarding, innovative require skill. There's a lot of qualifiers for this. And the answer to whether a fight is well designed or not lies within the context of the game we're talking about and the context of the fight itself. However, he is right in saying that it can be satisfying to beat someone of similar power to you. All I have to add to that is that it can also be satisfying to kill things that are more powerful than you, and things that are less powerful than you too, depending on the context. The best boss fights in Devil May Cry are the fights against Virgil or Dante or another human-sized opponent with another ridiculous sword. The best boss fight in God Hand, and also gaming history, is against Azel, who has the Devil hand, and so on. Okay, since this isn't really remotely about Dark Souls or the sequel at all in particular, I can let your statements slide. But if I was to take it seriously, I would wonder what you think arguing these games among the hundreds of thousands you could reference will add to your argument. This would be what's called cherry picking. I could have said only fights against the big and powerful enemies are the best while everything else is worse, and this is true because the best fight in God of War 3 is against Hades. And the best fight in Terraria is the Wall of Flesh, and the best fight in The Binding of Isaac is against Hush. First of all, we would need a qualifier on why these fights were the best. If that were true, then we would move on to the context of the game itself, the genre, etc. Perhaps even the narrative to figure out why you felt the way you did, or why you think it's a fact. Because my statement there and yours are heavily subjective without any supporting evidence. For reference, there is an old argument that goes like this. We know that we can trust the words of the Bible because it was written by God, and we know that because it's in the Bible, which we can trust because it was written by God. We know that the best fight is on equal footing because the best fight in Devil May Cry was on equal footing, and we know that was the best fight because the best fight is on equal footing. Basically, you're going to have to make a much stronger argument than that. It's far more compelling to fight a person making use of skills you yourself could be using than someone with far more powers than you or who is an incomprehensible mess. It feels good, to put it simply. Whether it is more compelling or less compelling, it is not only dependent on the player personally, but it's also down to the game's context, as we have covered. An enemy with far more power can be intensely more compelling to defeat as well as something that is an incomprehensible mess. As I said, it depends on the player. But then he says it feels good, to put it simply. This is now a different argument altogether. I'm sure you felt good with it since you made this video, but let's be fair, whether it feels good would more than likely be based on the person, and once again the context of the game. Dark Souls had a couple of regular enemies in the game who scratched this itch for me. Like, uh, the NPC invasions, like Manny to Mildred, uh, Lautrec, the crestfallen guy when he goes hollow, or Oscar when you return to the asylum, or Rickard. These kinds of fight are the best and most memorable. In fact, I just remember those offhand. I didn't even put those in the script. I just decided to list them because I just know them all. For me, best and most memorable. I just remembered those offhand. I know them all. This has no bearing in objectivity. You might as well have said, I like it and that means it's better. There is nothing to respond to here in terms of analysis. None of it goes beyond personal experience. I could have said the exact same thing about the opposing force, that huge bosses are the best and most memorable. I'm confused because objective arguments were being made at one point, but now this is entirely his own personal thoughts and feelings. Which won't be very useful in the grand scheme of defending Dark Souls 2 on an objective level. The interesting thing, however, is that this line may give you some insight into his script writing. He didn't look into this, he simply added it from what he remembers. This would imply that he doesn't often use genuine events to create his points. Rather, he uses what he remembers, and this means his script very likely doesn't go beyond a first draft, while in comparison, this is my fifth. PvP is so fun in these games for this exact reason. You're fighting people on the same footing as you with access to the same resources. It's just great. So he says PvP is so fun in these games. 
I'm afraid I completely disagree. If we are to take this to mean all phantom battles, be it real people and AI in the game, then yes, as an umbrella assessment, the experience of engaging within it is absolutely horrendous for the majority of the time. But how do I prove that? When PvP is functioning well, you'll find that most of the fights will run like you are simply looking for an opportunity to stunlock your opponent until your stamina runs out. Once that happens, you move away, dodge an attack or two, and then repeat the opening step. Sometimes there'll be a parry or a backstab that was tactical, and perhaps you can use the environment to your advantage, but most of the time, especially if you have a weapon suited to dueling, it will end the same way and can be extremely monotonous. This is if it is functioning. You see, the issue here is that the AI within the Phantoms can actually break and get lost, preventing you from using a bonfire and forcing you to either quit or kill yourself, which is awful, but the timeout is so long that you're left with no choice if they lose you which is very common within the invasions in the gutter especially. Oftentimes, however, the enemies can simply break and forget how to be enemies, making the fights a joke. <laughs> oh my god. Oh man, and NPC invasions are so hard. The fact is that when they are running as intended, they are placed within your world no matter what is currently happening. And it gives you several moments of being absolutely overrun or overwhelmed. They don't even care if you're dead, they'll be giving you an invasion when they feel it's time. Let's not forget the gimmicky PvP battles from the DLC that are incredibly frustrating to deal with. Enemies that drag you into the depths to simply provide a challenge. There would nowhere to go. Oh. Piss off, no. PvP will usually find a way to ruin your current run, but if the AI is functioning and it doesn't necessarily interrupt your engagement with other enemies, then it can behave as intended, but Harris describes it as fighting on the same footing. Let me be absolutely clear. These invasions are very rarely fights that could ever be considered fair. You will oftentimes find that they deal far more damage than you do. They have far more health than you do. They have access to abilities that you've yet to discover. Okay, I know what that spells does now. And I'm dead. Oh, Dennis, go fuck yourself! I really like that aspect to it. It's, it's genuinely something that's cool. You fucked up that heal heals you too, heals you too if you stand in it as well, I think. Oh. What the fuck? More health, please. This is fucking shit. Like, he does so much damage when I'm in melee range. He does even more when I'm f far away. It's like, um... So how do I beat this guy? No, no, he doesn't get good. And then he fucking dodges my attacks too, like... Oh my god! Oh, this is so fun! They have apparently infinite stamina, agility, persistence. They can kill you after they've died for Christ's sake. And yet, despite all of this, the failing AI, which we will cover, can cost them everything. Someone who's so powerful can be reduced to a fool. However, even with terrible AI, they survive with incredibly unbalanced healing and health pools. When you are faced with these very common experiences consistently, you may very well end up like a friend of mine who absolutely lost interest in PvP after interactions like this one. What? Um, hello, neck coding. Oh, what the fuck? Just give him a little, a little friendly hello. What the fuck is that? That is some fucking bullshit net coding if I've ever seen it. What is that? What was that? Oh, that didn't hit me. I'm out of range of that. Like. The PvP in this game is shit. I hate that they...
Can I make this offline somehow? I don't see how people can defend this fucking PvP. It's so bullshit. Oh, it's this asshole again. I'm killing myself. Yeah, fuck this guy. Sadly, if you're invaded by an AI, you can consider yourself lucky, as human invaders will use surrounding enemies against you. Oh, come on, man. That is not fair. Is this an NPC, or is it a... Yeah, it's not an NPC. It's an actual guy. Ah, oh, sigh, sigh, sigh. And he's just gonna wait down there? Because he knows that I have... Oh my god, this guy is such a fucking dick. Yeah, well, that was fun. She's literally... I can't... There's nothing I can do. She's just gonna keep running into further in, so I'm gonna have to keep killing everything first. This is why I play Dark Souls. Yeah, there she goes again. Or flee from you at every available moment, healing as much as they can and relying on guerrilla tactics to defeat you, making use of the exploits in the game. There are far too many in the game. In Black Gulch I was invaded three separate times within ten minutes as I was exploring the area. This can be incredibly frustrating. I just need to pee really quickly. Oh, for fuck's sake, I want to take a fucking whiz. Yeah. Are you kidding me? I'm gonna get invaded right here. Oh my god, fuck off. Perhaps the most frustrating part to all of this is the fact that these things won't even come into play as objective criticisms if the netcode isn't even functioning. You will find that throughout the game, the enemies will be able to perform attacks and critical strikes on you when they had absolutely no chance of doing so from your perspective, because on their screen, I'm sure they pulled it off, but on yours, nothing of the sort was even possible. This gets incredibly ridiculous and shouldn't be something you are forced to deal with. There is barely anything objective about PvP in the Soulsborne series, whether you're against the AI or human invaders. I happen to think it's utterly crap as a system, clawing at any chance to run properly, but most often doesn't, resulting in absolutely abhorrent gameplay that can fuck up your run or adversely ruin your time with the game. You're welcome to enjoy it, but if you consider it flawless, then you've been incredibly lucky. What is this? What is this? Okay, thanks game. Can I just run through- oh my god, just fuck off, will ya? Many people argue that Dark Souls 2 has the best PvP, and that is absolutely fine. Since many of the problems I've mentioned are present in the PvP throughout the games, therefore Dark Souls 2 is welcome to be the least smelly poop in the toilet. But it is absolutely still a poop. As for it being fun, please remember the difference between subjectivity and objectivity. I am telling you about the functionality of the thing being terrible, not that your feelings aren't valid. Enjoy the PvP all you want, it's just not well made. Which, if we cross-reference to Bloodborne, you seem to know about, Harris. There's a cat who wants to help you protect the garden from other real human players. If you join their covenant and wear their ring, occasionally you get summoned in as a blue phantom, so you, yes you, can get backstabbed from 10 feet away and wonder if PvP will ever fucking work in these games. Like, dude, I genuinely find that delivery funny, and it's like a solid joke, but it seems to me that you're aware that PvP doesn't quite work, and yet you omit that from the analysis in this video. I have no idea what Harris really thinks PvP is, but it doesn't consistently work as intended, and whenever it does, they have far more health, far more damage, far more stamina than you, and they are not your equal. Let's not forget about them turning it into a boss as well. This is probably one of the worst things about the DLCs, but we, we can tackle that later. But in Dark Souls, the only boss fight that comes really close to getting this right is Artorius in the DLC. Ornstein and S kind of did it, but you were too busy dealing with the other guy, uh, so you could never really focus on the aspect of the fight that's like this straightforward cool duel, you know? 
and then they get really big and then it becomes a very different kind of thing. Okay, what happened here? Now, now, now you, you're just saying what you like better. What do you mean the only boss that comes close to getting this right? The idea of being on equal footing? What about Capra Demon? Is he a foot too large? What about the Four Kings? Are they, they, they've got to be too tall, right? What about Gwyn? Is he too end gamey? What about Pinwheel? Is he, is he too magic-y? What about Priscilla? Is she, she's too dragony? What about Gwendolyn? Is she, he too, too fluid? I don't understand your extremely strange and specific metric for this arbitrary restriction. How is Artorius considered on equal footing anyway? Please give me more to work with here. The reason this comes across as random is because you're picking and choosing what fights you liked and pretending that there's some kind of through line with them. What I would personally just say is that the ones I like are the ones I consider well designed. And then they'd all have separate reasons. But you're going with this equal footing thing. Please, please give me something better to work with. Artorius is a really really good fight. He's not exactly on equal footing with you, he's presented as a very strong person, larger than life, literally, corrupted by evil, but he's a brilliant fight because he never comes off as ridiculous. He even dodges and rolls the way a person would. You get this fantastic mix of outsmarting a fellow consciousness trying to beat you in a straight fight. Thank you. Okay, so here he says that this is a really, really good fight. Front loading again. However, this time it's more okay because Artorius is considered one of the greatest fights in the series. But he also opens with the caveat, not exactly on equal footing with you. I find this hilarious because by any stretch of the imagination, Artorius of the fucking abyss is far and away a more powerful being than you. His mere representation presentation in Harris's video is strong evidence of that, yet Harris wants to argue that Artorius never comes across as ridiculous, that he even dodges the way a person would. What person, pray tell, dodges like this in real life? And were they in low gravity at the time? I mean, fuck, he leaps like 10 meters into the goddamn air and you think that he even dodges and rolls the way a person would? To explain how this happened, Harris holds the idea of equal footing duels very high, and his entire section here has already established that they are in fact the best the games have to offer. This means all the PvP nonsense and the dudes in Armor and Dark Souls 2 get to fall beneath this banner with ease. But he also liked Artorius, so now you see him cannibalize his own specifications to allow Artorius to slip through and be beneath the banner as well. But if Artorius can, then Capra can, Gwyn can, the Four Kings can, Pinwheel can, and so so on. Hell, why not every boss, since they all just have variations? Some are with company, some are more magically inclined, some are slower or less damaging. Surely changing a slider here and there doesn't matter all that much? When you say he's not exactly on equal footing, you've already set cracks all over your statement, and to be honest, it has been difficult for me to really understand your argument from this point anyway. Before Dark Souls 2, I would describe Knight Artorius as the platonic ideal of a Dark Souls boss fight. It's the most pared down, purified form of single combat with another swordsman in the Souls games, and that's really, to me, the best thing. Platonic ideal? Pared down, purified form? What the fuck are you talking about? Why can't you simply say that it is your personal favorite kind of fight and leave the definition of that kind up in the air? Since it is impossible to draw a collective that includes the majority of Dark Souls 2 bosses and Artorias while excluding the majority of bosses from Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls. Instead of doing that, you're using descriptive words that we will all have to Google, vaguely understand, and then apply what we imagine you're saying to since it's so unclear. Instead of sharing what you actually think, which is is Artorius is the best battle in Dark Souls 1, and honestly, Harris, that's a solid opinion to have. So it's fine to say, though it would be admitting that you have no tangible metric for it. My own personal preference for a good fight in Dark Souls is something that is balanced, something that will survive many strikes from me, while simultaneously showing it has the ability to kill me, but never in one strike. Admittedly, that is dependent on my build, but it isn't that alone. It is also about reasonable telegraphing, you know, allowing time for reactions, uh, selectively strong or weak traps tracking based on swing speeds and damages. I want the boss to be able to give me a chance to understand it in my first fight if I pay close attention and approach with care, and being able to account for their offensive abilities while also having a clear opportunity to strike. It doesn't matter how big they are or how fast or what they look like as long as I'm able to engage with them. All I care about is that there is something tangible to learn about them and a rhythm to the battle. It honestly doesn't matter if they have the same opportunities as me. For example, every boss has more health than I do when I battle them and 
and that's okay. Every boss deals more damage than I do with their strikes, and that's okay. They will often have more movability, and that's that's okay. What I don't like fighting is, as Harris put it, an incomprehensible mess or a crowd of basic mobs that turn my meticulous rhythm-focused game into a bog-standard hack-and-slash, asking me to simply herd a series of enemies until I can blindly slap at them with my weapon. I don't like ridiculously easy boss fights that serve to only remind you that you're playing a game. Bosses with no purpose outside of slowing you down, because despite their sometimes large health bars, you are very unlikely to be killed by them and will often have to wait to gain an opportunity to even find a weak spot, thus turning the game into a more of a green light, red light situation, rather than a more rhythmic back and forth that is offered by bosses like Artorius. Like, I'm not over-exaggerating here, the Guardian Dragon literally flies away from you, and if you're a melee player, you're left to fucking sit there. My favourite fights from the series would have to be Ornstein and Executioner Smo, Father Gascoigne, Lord of Cinder, the Fume Knight, Lady Maria of the Astral Clock Tower, the Bell Gargoyles, the Pursuer, Dancer of the Boreal Valley, Orphan of Kos. Honestly, I just like a well-telegraphed, tight hitbox, built-up boss fight. It can be a different number of enemies, a really fast enemy, an enemy that is seemingly improbable to defeat at first, but proves to be within its own rhythm that is learnable. My specifications are more about the fight being well made and developed rather than it being about size or power of the enemy, and that's why I can't understand your specifications. Fighting a person who has the same access to the skills and powers you have, yet the members of PvP and Artorias fit this description? That's nonsense. Dark Souls 2 has a lot more of this kind of fight than the previous two games, and more than Bloodborne also. And this, I must stress for me, it, it, this is my opinion, is a gift. The Pursuer, the Lost Sinner, the Looking Glass Knight, Velstat, and that in the DLCs, the Fume Knight, and Sir Alon, and the Burnt Ivory King. In my opinion, these fights are what the Souls games mechanics are vessels for. This is what the game should be built around. Okay, so by this kind of fight, he's referring to fights he likes, which seems to be the guys who are between a similar and greater height to the player. Or a more simple way of putting it, humanoid fights. That's nice, but he's done a terrible job of explaining why this is the best kind of fight. He then says that the increase in humanoid fights we get is a gift. Of course, he makes sure to say that it is a gift from his perspective, but I still don't understand because I just like the fights that are well made. Telling me they're going to be more humanoid enemies isn't really giving me any information about the enemy at all. The fights you've referenced can all be very much entertaining and engaging. Personally, I enjoyed them more so than other bosses in the whole game. I deemed them to be the best design bosses except for the first phase of Burnt Ivory King, but I find it odd that you didn't reference any of these fights. It's almost like you omit them on purpose. First, we have the monotonous and easy fights like, ugh, I don't know, Throne Watcher and Defender? Yeah, I understand that you may be surprised I referenced them first in easy or monotonous boss listings, but y you know me, guys. I like me some evidence-based arguments, so. I would like to show you Fortia approaching the Throne Watcher and Defender. Enjoy the resulting gameplay. This guy just let me take off half of his health without moving. Like, is he just gonna stand there forever, or is he gonna get resurrected? Oh, he just stays until she dies. Uh, like, that's the I thing, I can't can. really put a finger on it, but bosses in this game just generally... Oh wait, she's doing something. <laughs> I took off all of her health. <laughs> This isn't some subjective experience. Throne Watcher and Defender are pitiful bosses, but they are usually approached as a first phase to a larger boss fight. And most don't pay a lot of attention to them when they consider the bosses of the game, when they really should. But they aren't alone in a list of incredibly monotonous and easygoing bosses. We have the Last Giant, Executioner's Chariot, the Rotten, the Covetous Demon, Aldia, the Giant Lord, the Ancient Dragon, the Old Iron King, and Nashandra. These fights all involved you essentially wailing on a target and waiting for them to finally make a move that could be avoided very easily by one roll or sometimes even simply walking only to continue hacking away just gonna takes away your health your health bar should be enough to kill her actually uh... <laughs> I don't know it's just weird to me that you fight three bosses in a row. Like, doesn't that tell you something about the bosses? That maybe they're supposed... 
or need to be a little bit more difficult than being able to uh, I just imagine fighting Seath, four kings and Nido straight after each other that would never fucking work Unless you're like really pro at the game. And then we have the fights that are just spamming normal or slightly buffed up mobs like the Skeleton Lords, the Belfry Gargoyles, Prowling Magus and the Congregation, the Royal Rat Authority, the Gank Squad, the Royal Rat Vanguard. That's not a boss. That's just a fucking swarm of enemies that, that are there. And then you have like one. Oh, that one has a mohawk. That's the Rat King. It's like, fuck off. These fights truly attempt to convert Dark Souls from a meticulous rhythm-focused game with many variables to a bog-standard hack-and-slash, mindless and repetitive, irrelevant of your choices beyond hitting R1 and herding the enemies. Now I understand that The Last Giant is essentially a tutorial boss, and many may have different experiences with each of the easy bosses. So what I can say is that they each have large and simplistic exploits. For example, the ancient dragon simply requires that each time it jumps, run to the tail, wait for it to land, hack away, and repeat. And most of the mob enemies could genuinely be difficult for people, but that is still terrible. To simply spam casual mobs, lock up the room with fog walls, play a new track, and add a collective health bar. If I was to be completely honest about the bosses of Dark Souls, then I would have to mention the bosses that are terrible. Bed of Chaos is inexcusably awful, and I don't even have to specify why. If you've played the game, you know. Gaping Dragon is absurdly easy, Capra Demon seems to have been provided his dogs because the boss itself was simply not fleshed out while alone, but it seems like Harris is going to try and focus far away from the weaker bosses of Dark Souls 2 to draw as much attention away from any flaw to paint a picture. He says these fights are what the games are vessels for and what the game should be built around. I find this absolutely fascinating as a perspective, and we are going to return to this statement. There's even the old Dragon Slayer. A version of the Ornstein and Smurz fight that indulges in this aspect more than fighting two people at once could do. Okay, so first of all, this isn't a version of Ornstein and Smo. This is Ornstein with some different moves and no second phase, just a boss fight that is relatively straightforward and telegraphed. Sure, it looks just like Ornstein and it has a lot of the same moves, but it's nothing more than that. Secondly, you say that it indulges in this aspect more than fighting two people at once could do. The aspect is the whole duel thing being against one person on equal footing. Therefore, to repeat what Harris just said, but put in simpler terms, fighting one opponent allows the player to fight one opponent, while fighting two opponents does not. He's right, though I suppose that won't explain why he just said it. I remember telling my friends that I'd wished they'd been a one-on-one -on -one fight with a character like Ornstein, perhaps as a mini-boss later on, and those friends played the PS3 version of 2 while I waited for it to come out on PC. The first thing they did when it came out was tell me where to go for for a cool surprise over Skype, and I got the fight I'd wanted from the previous game. This, as many people are probably already aware, is an anecdote. As you may have already noticed, I've been color coding my response to Harris. It's about how contentious I find the comments. Green is essentially a pass, while blue means I both agree and disagree with it in certain ways, and red means that I have a huge problem with what he's said. And brown? Brown means that it's an irrelevant anecdotal comment. Not all anecdotes are irrelevant. For example, the story about my friend who prefers games to be simple could very well be a lie, but we all know that people like him exist, and those people prove theories about objective fun wrong. Anecdotes can be useful when explaining how you feel about something or the experiences you've had to explain something personal to an audience. However, the point of this section was supposed to be about enemy design and why dudes in armor are awesome, right? I'm gonna argue in favor of dudes in armor. He has now added the fact that he always wanted to fight Ornstein alone to his argument. Arguments are better served without anecdotes for the vast majority of time, as anyone can make up an experience to support their argument. And even if the anecdote is true, it doesn't hold true as a guarantee for anyone other than the subject of the anecdote. This means it muddies up the analysis and makes it hard for the audience to disseminate facts from feelings. For example, I would now like to share the story of my friend Chungus. It's not a racist name, he's just Welsh. Chungus said that the old Dragon Slayer was far too easy as a fight, regardless of your level, which was disappointing after the kindergarten-like boss previous to him. He said it was just an attempt to copy what was great about Dark Souls, but only in reference, and really it just serves to place a random boss fight in an arena, so that it doesn't feel like an empty, pointless area. Chungus also shared that he was once assaulted by a man wearing Ornstein's armor in real life, and when he fought the old Dragon Slayer, Slayer, it reminded him of these times, and he said it was an overall bad experience. And there we have it. It began as an actual argument that could have been backed up by reasonable, measurable evidence and accuracy, but devolved into an experience specific to 
one person. This little anecdote, however, does explain more of Harris's love for Dark Souls 2 as it gave him what he personally wanted rather than the game itself having a level of quality people failed to see, which could explain his bias towards it. I'm sure people complained that this was a needless rehash or fan pandering, but it was literally a fight I specifically thought would have been fun and missed not having. And I'm glad someone working on Dark Souls 2 agreed with me. So he brings up the idea that seeing the old Dragon Slayer could be considered a needless rehash or fan pandering, but doesn't provide a counter-argument to that aside from saying that he personally thought it would be fun. I don't think I need to point out just how weak of an argument that is. Giving us Ornstein in Dark Souls 3 was pandering, giving us Ornstein in a world that has forgotten Lordran, Gwyn, and the Age of Ancients was entirely blatant pandering. Next he says that he's glad someone working on Dark Souls 2 agreed with him? You think that someone on the design team in From Software agreed with you that what was missing in the battle with Ornstein and Smo was the chance to fight Ornstein alone in his smaller form and so added that imagined fight in Dark Souls 2? Why wouldn't they just make a new boss that was good? What could your evidence for this possibly be? How could you possibly know? I think it's far more likely to be a paper-thin reference to the more meme-like elements of the Souls games, like several other choices that were made in this game. But I can't know for sure, and neither can you. Oh, he hit me. Good job. Oh yeah, oh my god. Oh, it's so amazing. Oh, what a great fight. Yes, yes. Fuck off. Yep, everybody loves that fight. Honestly, when I saw early critics saying Dark Souls 2 is pretty great, but you fight a lot of dudes in armor, I remember immediately thinking, hell yes. There are other kinds of fight, and it's good to have them, but they are the best. So, now I'm getting completely lost on his argumentation. He says that a complaint from critics as this game was being released was that there were too many fights with dudes in armor. If this were me back then, I would be curious as to what they would say the problem was more specifically, because that statement alone is very vague. Do they mean it's boring? Repetitive? Harris instead responds by saying, hell yes, which, if he were my friend, I would be asking him how in the hell he even qualifies a dude in armor fight, since Dragon Rider and something like the Fume Knight are completely different as boss fights, yet both fall into this category. It cannot be that it's as simple as being a humanoidish creature, since the Asylum Demon has all four limbs while standing upright, so he can fit that description, but if we're taking the humanoid definition as anything that's shaped exactly like a human, then barely anything can fit. Certainly not the majority of the bosses Harris has been talking about, and this is because they're all too large to be considered human. The point of this rant here is to prove that the criticism of Dark Souls 2 having too many dudes in armor is a weak argument from those early critics, and I disagree with whoever made it unless they can add a qualifier, but Harris's response is also incredibly weak, offering nothing in terms of definition for the kind of fight he loves and why he assumes something with such clarity, when it is impossible to picture what he could even be talking about with any consistency that could possibly encompass all of the fights we've been discussing. Finally, he says they are the best in reference to dudes in armor fights, which is still as irrelevant as ever. Does it actually have anything to do with armor even? The Lost Sinner literally doesn't wear armor. Perhaps one of the worst things about Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1 is they didn't properly master this idea yet. Demon Souls had the penetrator, don't laugh, and some decent NPC fights like Garl Vinland, the actual final boss of the Valley of Defilement. I mentioned the ones Dark Souls had, but Two elevated these fights to their proper place as the core kind of fight you did the most, and I love it for that. They didn't properly master the idea of fights you wanted. You mean to have me believe that when they built fights like Grave Lord Nito, Seath the Scaleless, the Four Kings, and Ornstein and Smo, completely changing your own perception of the correct way to approach a battle and giving them all their own narratively and aesthetically suitable positions in the world and a lead up to each of them that matched them thematically with their own strengths and weaknesses. Are you telling me that while dealing with that, you were wishing to see more bosses like Dragon Rider? I'm sorry that you didn't get what you wanted in Dark Souls 1, but that doesn't prove that Dark Souls 1 failed to master anything. That's ridiculous. He says, as if naturally true, that Dark Souls 2 elevated these kinds of fights to their proper place as the core kind of fight. What? 
The core kind of fight, meaning the kind of fight you do the most, because the game's common fights amount to hitting zombies, skeletons, spiders, rats, and townspeople to death. And if you're referring only to boss fights, then I think you need to take another look at the sheer amount of non-dudes in armor, as you put it, encounters that are in the game. Because this is now getting ridiculously hard to follow. Besides, you do know that many people look at those knights you're referring to as good fights to be cannon fodder, right? That they are spammed in areas to keep the player from falling asleep at the wheel, as it were? I'm not making the claim right now, but you should really look into other people's natural responses to these kinds of things, these kinds of encounters and the other incredibly boring yet effective gameplay that will often follow. And on top of that, I already have a shitload of fucking upgrading materials, so I'm pretty sure I don't really need them. Oh, another one? These guys have a lot of health. Instead of thinking about alternate perspectives, you've really just got a narrow-minded view, assuming that these are the best battles in Dark Souls, when in reality, they are far from it. The Heidi Knights are criminally underrated. They deliberately look and fight very differently from the Black Knights of Dark Souls 1, and if you let them get up, which you should do because why else are you attacking them, they sit down and do nothing on purpose until you want to fight them. The fight is usually pretty cool. They kill me a lot. So, I can't show me beating them here really easily, which would have been nice footage to have, but, um... I'm sorry? Now we've shifted focus entirely from boss fights to a random mob that appears in very limited parts of the game. The Hyde Knights, also I'm not sure if it's Heidi, Hyde, or Hoid, or eh, yeah, so I'm just saying Hyde because it sounds cooler. The Hyde Knights are visually interesting, and I have to say, swinging from side to side in a way that implies they are partially blind was very much a new and engaging thing. But they also have several attacks that are extremely poorly telegraphed. What the fuck? As for criminally underrated, well, I found them pretty annoying personally. Trying to deal with the spear one was incredibly frustrating because of his damage output and speed, and the fact that they aggro from so far away while also being in early game areas. So I guess I would have to see how they are rated overall to decide if it's unfair. Honestly, I would prefer to not have to interact with them at all, since their poorly constructed attack patterns don't really make for rewarding gameplay. Rather, you will try and hack them to death before they get a chance to immediately strike you. As for the statement about their aggression, it tells us that Harris hasn't given much time to Dark Souls 2 or Scholar of the First Sin. He doesn't know how the Hyde Knights work. In the original Dark Souls 2, Hyde Knights were found in many parts of the game and would only attack you if provoked. In Scholar of the First Sin, the Hyde Knights are mostly found in Hyde's Tower. They aren't hostile aside from the two nearest to Ornstein's boss arena, and once you kill the Dragon Rider, they will begin to roam and aggro straight towards you if you're within their limits. This makes them quite difficult to deal with early game, and combined with their pattern of movement, they can be difficult to kill, which would explain the part where Harris admits they kill him a lot, and he doesn't have footage of beating them. As much as he plays this off as a joke, it is interesting that he doesn't have footage of defeating them, since many people complain that they are unpredictable and heavily damaging, which would be a valid criticism from Harris himself if he was willing to criticize Dark Souls 2. More importantly, however, Harris says that they sit down and do nothing until you want to fight them on purpose with a rather smug tone. So why don't they do that on Scholar of the First Sin? Or did you forget that they aggro during that version? Examples like this are where you start to see cracks forming on his knowledge of the game, and there will be more obvious examples as we progress. The narrative critics create when they talk about dudes in armor is that the developers ran out of ideas, but with just a slight change in perspective it becomes clear that the developers had a really good new idea, which was to use more of a kind of fight that was vastly underutilized in previous games and worked really well. Does that really count as a new idea? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm going to claim it is at least, and you can't stop me. It's a fundamental change in the makeup of the game, and in my opinion, it's for the better. Now, I can't speak for what people criticizing the game believe, but the dudes in armor thing does not represent to me that the developers ran out of ideas. What does give me that impression is that in Scholar of the First Sin, at the very least, they copied a hell of a lot of bosses and had them pasted everywhere instead of making new enemies. The Guardian Dragon from Aldia's Keep was copied over to the Blue Cathedral and subsequently throughout the Dragon Eyrie, and he literally just keeps showing up when they had him as a boss about two minutes prior. What is the difference with these and the boss? I guess the boss has a boss health bar. The extremely lazy part was that 
but they didn't realize that a literal copy and paste was unsuitable for this boss since using his fire breathing moves on such a small platform compared to the cage he's meant to be in results in very frustrating deaths. But the lazy enemy duplication doesn't stop there. They copy the pursuer from the forest of the fallen giants and pasted him into six different areas, but added some dark stuff to him to shake it up. They copy and pasted the flexile sentry from No Man's Wharf over to Sinner's Rise. They copied a gargoyle from the Belfry Lunar and pasted it into Drang Lake Castle, but then they copied the Ruin Sentinels and pasted them five separate times into Drang Lake Castle as well. Not to mention that they used a very simplistic enemy for the boss in Hyde's Tower, known as the Dragon Rider, and then copied and pasted him twice to act as another boss battle while coloring one of them black, then used him again as a random to battle on an extremely tight walkway in the Shrine of Amana, and then used him again to act as a bodyguard to Velstad's boss door in the Undead Crypt. They copied the Smelter Demon from the Iron Keep and gave him a blue paint job and pasted him into the DLC, but perhaps a bit funnier. They copied Covetous Jabba from Earthen Peak and gave him a faint blue coat and pasted him into the third DLC, but cranked his health and damage to a ridiculous level. Perhaps the most egregious and downright jarring would be the fact that they copied Executioner's Chariot from Undead Purgatory and pasted it into Drang Lake Castle. What a ridiculously inappropriate enemy to have here simply because they didn't want to create something new. A single decrepit zombie horse just chilling in the middle of the most respected and well-kept castle in Drang Lake. Now, I understand that these appearances are not all in Dark Souls 2, but you guys have to understand that in the description for Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin, it is referred to as the Definitive Edition and the Director's Cut. This means it is the version that the developers consider to be their completed work. All DLCs come with it. The game has been given graphical and cinematic upgrades, including new graphical filters, a jump from 720 to 1080, and a more significant jump from 30 FPS to 60 FPS. When considering all of these things, I would never play Dark Souls 2 before Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the the first sin, but not because of some cool expansion like Ori in the Blind Forest Definitive Edition. No, it is simply because it is the superior technical version and that is the result of the shady business decision of walling off fundamental functionality of the game to force your players to shell out another $30 to be able to play with the basic settings afforded to everyone else in their other base games. But I suppose that's just an opinion, right? Anyway, the point is that developers have made extremely lazy decisions to repeat enemies even if they simply had no business popping up in the places they were reused. Do you remember the mage zombie in the congregation during that boss fight? Well, check him out. Exactly one clone of him secured a spot in the Dragon Eyrie. <laughs> it was and I was like, Wee! What the fuck is he doing there? All of these examples of this one trend in the game would be one of my arguments as to how they cut corners, but there are far more to get to. Regardless of that, Harris then says this. With a slight change in perspective, it becomes clear that the developers had a really good new idea. Now he's referring to the fact that they have more of his arbitrarily defined kind of battle on equal footing, which has been shown to not have any kind of actual limits or requirements, and apparently the concept of adding something we already have is a new idea. Harris, this is basically basic logic. Having five apples in Dark Souls 1 is an idea. Having eight apples in Dark Souls 2 is the same idea, but more apples. There's no controversial point to make here. You're simply being a contrarian. There's nothing to debate against. This is basic arithmetic. You then have a song and dance about claiming this to be true and no one can stop you. When the reality is, nobody would stop you. The internet is a wonderful place. Everyone can say unfounded, ridiculous nonsense. That, however, doesn't protect you from being criticized and proven wrong. Finally, you say it's for the better, which is funny to me. The idea of repeating assets throughout a game is great because you enjoy the fight themselves. Whether or not they wanted to add more of these humanoid fights for the sole goal of having more fun, the repetition of assets is obviously evidence of them either becoming lazy or running out of ideas. This cannot be denied. You enjoyed the battle with Artorias? Well, would you consider it better if in Dark Souls 1 Scholar of the First Flame, he just started popping up in random places? Perhaps guarding the boss door to Nito or Gwyn? This is simply more of a good fight and therefore cannot be considered a negative addition, correct? You see how that goes? Dark Souls has a few repetitions here and there, 
The Capra Demon and Taurus Demon were copied and pasted from their boss rooms to Lost Isolith. However, it is hard to tell whether they were placed in their respective fights before or after they were placed in Isolith. Because narratively it actually makes sense this time. This is the home of the enormous entity that spawned demons originally. So having the Capra Demon and the Taurus Demon be at home here is more than suitable, or at least more so than many of the choices in Dark Souls 2. How about a lone archer from the Iron Keep being copied and pasted to the top of Dranglet Castle? That makes sense. The fact that they are reused is indeed undeniable, but at least the effort was made to have it make sense instead of a zombie horse waddling around in the king's castle. Did the zombie horse have to get the four great souls to reach this area as well? That's not to say that's the only kind of boss fight, though. Like in Dark Souls, there are plenty of different kinds of fight breaking up the monotony against bigger bosses like the last giant, uh, there's unique one-of-a-kind fights like the one with Scorpion S. Najka, who visually resembles Quelag but is a very different kind of fight. But there's all kinds. There's the Royal Rat Vanguard, there's the Congregation, there's the Covert as a Demon, there's, uh, Mr. Chariot. Okay, I agree there are different kinds of boss fights and they can break up the monotony, but many of them are of such a low tier in terms of quality that breaking up the monotony of similar bosses and enemies with monotonous fights isn't a whole lot better. You first reference The Last Giant, which is a tutorial boss and an extremely simple one at that. I doubt many even remember the fight as most beat it in their first try, and he's incredibly forgiving. Then Scorpion S. Najka, who does indeed stand out from other bosses, but let's be fair, taking the narratively threaded Daughter of Chaos, who had been afflicted with the backfire of cursing her to be bonded to the frame of a demonic spider by trying to rekindle the first flame, is simply repurposed as a design with a scorpion instead. This is rather disappointing as new ideas go. Then you list all the horribly designed bosses in the game in quick succession while immediately moving to punctuate the point with a joke. There's a lot of purpose in the order to this. His goal is to prove that there are well-made bosses breaking up the monotony. He has to list bosses that couldn't possibly be considered dudes in armor, but ones that if given more of a spotlight needed to be defendable in in terms of quality. He gave us a boss that is very hard to criticize because of its form of a tutorial. He then gave us a relatively well-realized boss despite being a rehash, but after that he tried to slip some of the most egregiously bad bosses in the game right past the conversation. He mentions the Executioner's Chariot in a jokey way, which mechanically is more of an environmental boss with a simplistic hack and slash finish, but the arena was aesthetically cool I guess. Then there's the Congregation, which is just some repeated zombie mobs with a big zombie that fires projectiles and a room that could have been played in the exact same way without the fog doors and the boss bar, and nobody would have blinked an eye. You've got the Covetous Demon in there, which may very well be the most pathetic boss in the Dark Souls fucking series. I don't know what purpose he served by existing, he was a slow slug that acted as a punching bag and free souls. He is the Magikarp of Dark Souls. But the first one you mention, very quickly, is the Royal Rat Vanguard, which is literally a bunch of rats some of which don't even respond to your existence as you hack through them. The boss requires that you kill a bunch of rats over and over again until you kill the stylish one with a fucking mohawk. Then you win. This is perhaps the most embarrassing attempt at using a boss dynamic of a walled off area, a different soundtrack and a boss health bar in every game created by From Software. Oh great, the bunch of rats that use- Oh shit! Wait, is this a boss? What the fuck is this? Where's the main guy again? Oh, here he is. He, ooh. Come. Oh, he died. Ooh, all the rats going back in the hole. Come back, motherfucker. <laughs> My god, that was a weird boss. I think I hit him three times and he died. This is not a boss. This is a waste of time and an embarrassment to the game in general. Fucking mohawk. The point Harris is trying to make here is that Dark Souls 2 has the most best fights with the benefit of breaking up the monotony of that kind of fight as well, while in reality Dark Souls 2 has many of the same fights and whether or not they are well made is specific to each individual fight itself. But on top of that they have some genuinely awful designed and rushed together fights that come across as road bumps to remind you that you are playing a game that has bosses in it. And there's the Dark Lurker if you can be bothered to go do all the stuff that you need to do to fight him which I couldn't, so I, I didn't get any footage of it. If you can be bothered? 
Are you kidding me? Okay, I need to be very clear here. I've made this series of videos with the intention of being accurate and showing the origin of my assessments with evidence. To do this, I've played the game for an absurd amount of time and read the wikis back to front, while also looking into other people playing the game themselves. This means that I can honestly provide quite a show in terms of accuracy, entertainment, but more importantly, I can be completely honest. I never intend to make a discussion or critique or dissection video on any of From Software's games, because I know just how much time and effort it would take to make a video that fully represents these games in a fair and balanced manner. Like, I genuinely believe it would take me about a year, and the series would be very well beyond 30 hours long. I can, however, make a response video to someone else to simply look at their arguments and understand their perspectives, to tackle each point individually and dig deep into their ideas. In short, I put in effort to make some good videos. I am unapologetic about that. Meanwhile, Harris is talking about how great the bosses in Dark Souls 2 are, and yet admits he can't be bothered to fight Dark Lurker, because he had to visit three different areas and beat three different challenges. I killed Dark Lurker in more than six builds to get a grasp on what I thought of the fight in addition to the way that you approach it. While Harris likely played Dark Souls 2 once before creating this video, and placed a screenshot of Dark Lurker from the wiki to represent a point. Harris has often put in a lot of effort to show his work in videos in the past. They will often be his best pieces of work. However, here, his points are paper thin and completely untested. He doesn't know how the Hyde Knights work. He doesn't know what Scholar of the First Sin actually gives you as an upgrade from Dark Souls 2, nor what it changes. He isn't aware of alternate healing items. He isn't aware of the tactical element of Estus. He isn't aware that you can have infinite health without farming. He thinks farmable health may maintains balance, he's blissfully unaware of the problems presented by PvP, and he has no definition for equal footing. Harris doesn't really know a lot about Dark Souls 2 factually beyond what he really liked and experienced. This means he'll be pulling the party line of the game, being fantastic in as many ways as he can be, while remaining ignorant of significant facts, reason, and genuine pieces of evidence. Evidence that he could have found for himself had he put the time in. But hey, don't listen to me say this. If you pay attention, you can quite easily discern the places where they've actually decided to employ reason and skepticism and proper fact-checking, and the places where a sort of party line is formed of the same arguments repeating themselves over and over, but no one's really thought about the issue in that much detail. That is what I'm here for, Harris, to think about Dark Souls 2 in a huge level of detail. Now, I'm sure that some of you feel this was unfair and potentially rude of me to say, but as some of you may know, we are now approaching the part of the video where Harris will bring in criticism of Matthew Matosis's video, and he does not spare the rod on Matthew Matosis's ideas. Let's say it's less than civil. Many of you love Matthew Matthew Matosis, as he's been making extremely well-detailed videos for a long time on this site, while researching and providing evidence as much as he can, and many got frustrated with Harris's approach to Matthew in the upcoming analysis. For my videos, however, this means that not only will there be an extra layer to this analysis to make everything even more complicated, but it means that Harris is going to get far more difficult to respect as we move forward. For now, however, this is the end of the part. I hope you're enjoying this series, folks. This has taken far too long to construct, and I apologize for the delays. Hopefully the fact that these things are really long will kind of make up for that. Join me next time for the discussion to continue and to open up a third familiar voice. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time. No, no, no. This is okay. Like, if you don't kill enough people... Oh god, like, no. If you don't hit enough people, they just don't go in. Who knows, maybe this is a blessing in disguise. Oh, wow. This... Oh, there he goes. Guy actually didn't, didn't hit me. Wait, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> what? <laughs> the boss was just like, hey, where are you going? <laughs>